Hello and welcome to the final episode of Tales from the Oval. Um, John, we have reached the end of our batting order. Number 11 has come <laughs> to the wicket. And I know that yep. for both of us, <laughs> that's, that's a position that we've both held over the course it, of the it, years. It is. Uh, it and is, we know I that number 11 Tom... can be just as good as uh, any anybody else in the batting order. So hopefully you'll enjoy today's episode where we yeah, are absolutely. looking, well, we're looking to the past to work out the future. We're going to to draw on some of the themes that we've been looking at over the broad sweep of the Oval's history. Um, and John, you, you are ideally positioned to ask my questions about prompted by that. So I just to kick off way, way back, it must have been episode two. We talked about a match that was played outside Guildford at Gosden Common in 1745. And what was distinctive yeah. about this was that it was a, a match between two teams of women. So it was uh, the Bramley ladies versus the Hambledon ladies. And you remember the Bramley ladies wore blue ribbons and the Hambledon ladies wore red. And I think since then, we haven't really mentioned women playing cricket at all over the entire course of this series. So could we could we begin by rectifying that? Because obviously... Since yeah. the seventies, which is was, was, um, when the last episode was set, since then women's cricket has really, really become something massive, hasn't it? So, yeah. what role has Surrey played in that? It really has. Um, we we have mentioned it on a, on a couple of occasions. I think you know, there's there's certainly, I you know, been, been a few mentions of Natalie Sever as she should always as there's, there's, there should always be. But yeah, um, yeah, women's cricket has has been around in Surrey for. As, as as you say, the the, the match on Gosden Common, but but the, the first um, recorded instance that I can find of a team bearing the name of Surrey playing women's cricket um, was um, a game in eighteen eleven um, where they played um, a team representing Hampshire, uh, um, Bulls Pond in um, in Newington is where it's listed. So I presume that is in um, you know where Stoke Newington is now, um, and you know Bulls Pond Road. I presume you know led to led to to where, wherever that was played. And then, um, yeah, more formally after the foundation of the club, we the Surrey Women's Cricket Association was was founded in 1934. Um, and and shout out there to um, Raf Nicholson, who's an amazing historian of of the women's game. Um, Raf has a, a PhD in all of this, and and there's been so I don't know whether it's Raf that's done this, but someone has um, has digitised all the minute books of the Surrey Women's Cricket Association. They're all just scanned and sat there online. So so you know if you're if you're so disposed to do so, you can just leaf leaf through them. Um, so yeah, they were founded in um, March the second, nineteen thirty four. Violet Straker was their first chair. They played their first game in nineteen thirty five, which was also against Hampshire women. Um, that was at a ground called Blackwater in in Hampshire. Um, uh, yeah, and then the um, sorry women uh, played throughout uh, the period in between the nineteen thirties, and then and then the foundation of the Women's Area Championship in nineteen eighty, and then that became um, they entered the Women's County Championship in 1997. Um, and then, yeah, various other competitions. The London Cup was set up by Ebony Rainford Brent in 2015. Um, and then the London Championship was set up during lockdown, again, to continue um, playing more and more um, more and more competitions for the, for the women's team. Um, and of course, all those forms. So I only uh, have one trophy in the in the women's game, but it's it's a one I, I'm I'm have hugely fond memories of. It's the Keir Super League in, in twenty eighteen, which was the ECB's first real attempt to kind of set up a an unarguable top tier of women's cricket, if you like. And 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 yeah, there was a team in there called the Surrey Stars, led by Natalie Siver, um, as she was then, Natalie Siver Brunt, as she is now. And and yeah, they won that in in twenty eighteen with a team featuring um very young Sophia Dunkley, a very young um Maddie Villiers, obviously Natalie as well. Um, yeah, an absolutely glorious victory. And then just recently, we opened a gate, uh, the Silver Brunt Gate, commemorating that, that victory and commemorating that, Nat's position as, as captain of that team to following through the tradition whereby all the other gates around the ground are named by men's county championship winning captains. So obviously it's part of um, the Oval takes its place in a, a broader trend across um, England to promote the women's game, the girls' game. Uh, and... Mm. My daughters went to um, school in Brixton and I saw the evidence for that myself, how there's massive outreach going on to girls as well as to boys in in uh, local schools. But there is an issue, isn't there, for 
for Surrey um, that its feeding ground is is quite diminished. Because if we go back to uh, the reason that, that the Oval was built where it was, it was built on what was Kennington Common, which was the great place where people, Londoners would go to play cricket. And that was, you know, people were worried that it was being eaten up by development and that no cricket would be played. So the Oval is, is essentially all that remains of those cricket grounds. And that process of um, sports grounds and open spaces being chewed up has continued. And I think I'm right in saying that in, in Lambeth, where the Oval stands, it's the only cricket ground. So yeah, how much true. of a problem, and you think of all the, the people that we've talked about over the course of, um, of, of our history, all the great players who came from local streets, you know, from Kennington itself, from Brixton, from Clapham, whatever. Mm. Is that something that, I mean, that, that presumably has changed over the course of the decades and how much of a problem is it for, for the Oval, for Surrey, for cricket generally? that cricket is simply not being played in South London in the way that it used to be. Yeah, sure. It's it's an interesting point. I mean, it, it, you, you're right to say that the Oval is the only cricket ground in, in Lambeth. There, that is a slight, I would say, ge- geographical quirk because, you know, you, you do only a certain type of Londoner will look at London through borough boundaries and, and you do have brilliant places like Strat- Stratham and Marlborough Cricket Club, which is, you know, a matter of yards outside the barri- the, the, the boundaries of, of, of Lambeth and, and, you know, then um, in Southwark near Dulwich and you've got the incredible uh, Spencer Cricket Club out, out in, in Wandsworth, you know, who, who have a, a junior system with, with, with thousands of, of boys and girls in it. And, and you know, I, I think most people who live in Lambeth would, would consider Stratham and Marlborough and Spencer to be not that far away, but you're right, they do but sit John, outside just, I mean, the just, borough boundaries. But yeah. just, just, to, just to follow up on, on, on our previous episode where we were talking to Michael Holding and about the, 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 the immense sense of engagement that came from people who, from the Caribbean who were living in Brixton, mm coming Mm. up i mean that again is something that's faded um there isn't there are no cricket there's no cricket ground in brixton say no do you think that that's contributed to the decline of popularity of cricket with um black communities in lambeth a a little bit and it's it's interesting well there's no there's no sports ground in brixton at all which i find very interesting there's you know you you look at again just down the road from brixton dulwich hamlet you've got champion hill hugely historic football ground but also a football ground that that, that has modernized really intelligently and, and and has you know crowds of three and a half thousand watching um watching non-league football regularly and, and and you look around you in Brixton and you think if only there was a Champion Hill style football ground in Brixton mm. that it could be hugely hugely popular so I, I I don't I don't think it's just it's just cricket Brixton does just seem to be an oddly kind of barren place for for outdoor sports you know there's lots of you know, you've got some great indoor sports in Brixton, Brixton Rec and the Girls Boxing Club and places like that. But 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 yeah, outdoor sports is interesting. Um, going, going back to your point on on black support, it's I I find it yeah, it's it's something I'm, I'm I have a huge sort of personal interest in. Um, and it was amazing talking to Mikey uh, in our last episode about it. He's just you know one one of the you know there are many many things that Mikey is amazing, but just yeah, his 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 brain I think is is an underutilized thing in the in the modern game. Um, in 2020, um, I don't, I don't want to become, I'm really trying not to become the latest white person to expand as an expert in why black people don't like cricket anymore. So um, we, 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 we had a, a seminar, uh, which we held in 2020. We collaborated with the Institute of, um, of Commonwealth Studies, Professor Philip Murphy, and um, held a seminar where we tried to bring as many people together as we could do around who, who, who used to watch cricket who were part of those crowds that we talked about in the 70s well the 60s and 70s and and then and then the 80s you know ultimately leading up you know the blackwash test in 84 i think is kind of regarded as the as the peak of that of that era like the west indies were still very successful after that but but yeah the the test in in 88 i think yeah didn't quite have that that crowd invasion at the end that that you did in 84 and and like yeah, I just want to sort of talk a little bit, if it's okay, Tom, just about what some sure, of the people yeah, in, that, yeah, in, really that, in that seminar said. So um, John Holder was one of the people in that in that seminar, the the umpire, um, yeah. famous from from Ask the Umpire on Test Match Special, a great a great man of, of English cricket. And and what John talked about was was when he was young, he said that cricket was a way of um, he said it was a means really of helping us to settle in 
as 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 new arrivals in the country. It was a shared culture, and and Colin Babb, um, who who played a really key role in the seminars, written some fascinating books. Um, one of them called "We Gave Them Plenty Fun," um, which is a great book, fascinating. Um, really looked into this in, in this issue in depth. Colin talked about West Indies cricket as a, as a bonding agent for people from the Caribbean in the UK, which I found fascinating. So from the different islands. Yeah. So to quote Colin, he said, we have to remember we came here from different parts of the Caribbean. Often a Jamaican would never have met someone from St. Kitts. Often someone from St. Lucia would never have met someone from somebody from Guyana. Somebody from Antigua would never have met somebody from Trinidad and so on. It was in Britain, for example, where people from different parts of the region met each other for the first time. And even though we had similar migration experiences and faced similar challenges, cricket was something we could all unite around more often than not, which is, is, is fascinating because as a cricket fan, you see this through the, through the prism of the West Indies and, and cricket fans often, you know, do look at the island, that, that collection of, of, of sovereign nation states um, in the Caribbean Sea and consider it as the West Indies. And, and, and they're not. They are separate sure. islands because it's se- only the cultures. only the cricket team in the university of the west indies isn't it is the is the right yeah the, and, and institutions guyana. that join them yeah guyana guyana is a south american country on on, on the continent of, of south america you know so so and and and, it, and it's completely completely different to some of the countries folks so it's up there so it's it's a really interesting idea that we saw we I, that, that we see this homogenous culture coming over um as, as you know within this migration story and and actually it, it's it's far it's it's far from it so the um, yeah, I, I mean obviously um the, the we're fourth third fourth generation now from mm. the wind rush um so do you think that's just caught up in the kind of the attritional rate that has seen cricket decline in state schools sports grounds being sold off all that kind of thing well there's there's a little bit of that and and again look to, to refer back to this this seminar another person that participated in the seminar is a um another really great man called ronald mcintosh um you you know people may well be familiar with him he's a been a, a broadcaster for a, for a long time on the bbc he made documentaries commentated on on, on multiple olympic games boxing um etc really great guy um so so he talked about um he talked a little about about frank worrell um, and as we record this, Tom, it was ju- it would have been Frank Worrell's hundredth birthday on the um, on the first of August, just just gone. Yeah. Um, fascinating, fascinating character. Frank Worrell was the first black captain to lead a tour to England. Um, so that was 1963, and uh, Ronald talked in that seminar about the impact that that had on his dad in the 60s. And Ronald said that he felt when he saw Obama elected in 2008, only then was he really able to understand what that he thought may have meant to his to his father who who he described you know as a very political um political figure um again to to, to use ronald's words he said the one area for those who are subjugated either by sports administration or political legislation the one area that represents a level playing field and equality of opportunity and application of rules that are the same for all is the arena of sports and he went on to say to see excellence the very best of the best personified by a group of cricketers who looked and sounded like my father's, excuse me, sounded like the men in my family, principally my father, but those who were uncles by blood and by bond. That to me is incredibly important. And that team served as a gateway to learning about so many other things in terms of politics and identity and culture and social justice. And you see that this kernel of unity and connectivity is something that is shared by so many people across the black diaspora. But cricket was the gateway into all of those things for me. But, is, is but John, the question is, this. the question is, uh, what I mean, what is the role of the Oval in um, in a South London that is increasingly diverse, but where many of the communities, you know, so, so we're talking, focusing on the Caribbean communities, you know, they're now third or fourth generation and also where increasing numbers of people are coming to South London who don't have any kind of cricket heritage at all. Mm. So poles or whatever. Mm. Um, it's, is that a challenge for the Oval to, to maintain its profile as a kind of South London hub, do you think, or not? Is um, it an I issue that you're aware of? It, it's certainly an issue that we're, that we're aware of, absolutely. But I, I, again, I think this, this idea of cricket as a migration story is a, is a really interesting one. And you only had to look at the crowds we had, for instance, during the 2019 World Cup, I know Bang- Bangladesh don't play at the Oval too much because they they generally yeah I was there know, for that match yeah there, there was a couple and I of saw them. I saw Afghanistan as well 
yeah, yeah. Afghanistan. But 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 yeah, and and but but Bang- Bangladesh, the game was a complete sellout, as you would expect for a cricket world cup game at the Oval. But suddenly, when you were in there and you realised the crowd that come, there were fifteen thousand Bangladeshi fans there, I'd say, and they were fervent. It was it was absolutely incredible that you know I'd say at least ten thousand of them had brought huge cuddly tigers with them and were wearing replica kit and and and, and all sorts and 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 the passion. It was a Bangladesh New Zealand game that really particularly struck me and 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 it was it was an amazing conclusion and and yeah ronald again in the in the in the seminar talked talked about you know migration stories and he he talks about how you know he lives um in northwest london these days up sort of wembley harsden kind of way you know and 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 he said you know he he would see you know as soon as the sun started shining in the 70s and the 60s and 70s he'd see black kids out playing cricket now he sees the same thing but it's communities from, as you say, from Afghanistan and Bangladesh and Pakistan who 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 are out there playing cricket. But John, and, just and... just 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 to reiterate, d- does Surrey or the Oval feel a sense of mission at bringing cricket to people who otherwise might have no familiarity with it at all? So not just people, you know, people who've come to this country from non-cricketing countries, but also, you know, there are lots and lots of people. Cricket is not free to air on the on television anymore there are no sports facilities it can be quite yeah. difficult for people uh, you know in the streets of just around around the oval to have any yeah. sense of what cricket's about at all how what yeah. sense of mission do you feel that yeah that, we do that you have we do feel a sense of mission i think i think yeah absolutely um you know it's 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 hard to do but there's it's it's a as, as with everything it's a compound of it's a compound of factors there's a lot of um community work that we do so for instance if you're a child um a year uh, say a key stage two year 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 um nine-year-old ten-year-old child uh in in the kennington oval Vauxhall area those are the three kind of council wards around the oval if you like so that's what you know if you consider the direct local community of the oval kennington oval and Vauxhall. um we, we run a center in, in um, named after ben hollyoke the, the great surrey and england all-rounder who, who died very um early Tragic, before his time yeah. in 2002 yeah. very tragic 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 incident um so that center is named after ben and yeah that that is um i'd, I'd say you you it would be vanishingly unlikely if you if you to go through primary school in a primary school in in that area and not visit and the ben holyoke center yeah re, well, you know, very pretty 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 frequently and and ben holyoke center is brilliant because it, it introduces kids to cricket for the first time, um, but then also we've the, the club has kitted out the centre with some real state of the art Apple computers, and it does a lot of, of work in, on on the IT curriculum around things like coding and video editing and audio editing and stuff that schools find find harder to deliver. Um, we have the Surrey Cricket Foundation; they do a lot of great work. You know, we, we're recording this podcast, Tom, in in the second or third week of the of the summer holidays, um, and and you know they're 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 running holiday camps around around the place. Um, you know, we, I think in this context, you need to talk about Chance to Shine, who are a big funder of a lot of the work that the Surrey Cricket Foundation do. Um, you know, they're they're a charity um, headquartered at the Oval for a long time, um, whose whose purpose is to bring bring cricket back into state schools. And you 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 you're right in what you say in terms of you know South London is this constant, fascinating, amazing melting pot. And the Oval was, I think, incredibly fortunate for a long time, and and has carved out one of the most iconic parts of its history. Um, by by dint of the migration story that happened in South London after the Windrush and and in the second part of the the twentieth century um, and and yeah that those those days you know which which coincided with the incredible all conquering West Indian side of the the mid the mid seventies to the to the late eighties um, and, and 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 beyond um, was was represented incredibly at the Oval and 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 that what a you know confluence of circumstances that 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 those two things have come together and and you know would would we love that to return absolutely is it a simple thing to do absolutely not you know um, yeah I think I suppose in the context specifically of black cricket as well it's definitely worth talking about the ACE program um, which is something that was set up by Surrey as a community program um, in 2020 and is, has now been rolled out as an independent charity now you know Ebony Rainford Brent. Um, as when she was a director of Surrey, she's now on the board of ECB. Um, I, you know, I, I helped her with that. But I think, you know, Evan for Brent, also Chevy Green, um, have, have done incredible work in a, in a very, very short period of time. And, and, and you know, a large part of ACE um, is around supporting elite cricketers from that background. And it's about repopulating the um, the professional game, which, you know, in, in, in the 1980s looked very different for black cricketers than it than it does now. And, and yeah, ACE is, has 
is, is also does a lot of work to, to try and repopulate the, the, the community base of black cricket and, and, and then provide pathways for those talented cricketers. So, yeah, I mean, I think a sense of mission is, is, is the, the, the right way to put it, but it's, you know, it's, as I say, it's, it's not just one thing that you're trying to do that every, everything needs to come, needs to come together to create the whole. And it's important for the whole country that, that, the Oval does this because one of the things that has happened since, again, since the seventies, um, is is that the Oval has been buffeted by various crises, but has emerged from it <laughs> yeah. by the standards of other county cricket clubs. I mean, very secure, very rich, very successful, and just again, just you know, going back in time, this has been a feature of Surrey history right from the beginning. So we, we looked <laughs> yeah. at the William Houghton, the very dodgy chemist on Brixton Hill, who, oh, I, don't know. Um, I think he's misunderstood. Who, yeah. Who, who, uh, you know, who, who kind of first set up the Oval and then got driven out and so on. And, um, Charles Alcock, uh, who, again, we talked about this great yep. sporting entrepreneur, um, that these Love are, the, these are figures who, I guess embody the fact that although the Oval is clearly a historic ground, it's also always been a ground that's been happy to innovate and to take risks. So yeah. can you just talk us through how events since the 70s have yeah. perpetuated that tradition and how, yeah. you know, Surrey's re the, the relative security that Surrey has now has been built on quite a lot of hard work and, and, and a number of gambles. Going, yeah, you know, sure. I mean, which I William Houghton, I think, would be pleased to know. That I think he'd be the tradition of, this, of gambling yeah. is still going on. <laughs> it's firmly strong. Yeah. No, I think. Look, I, I think one of the things that's important is actually a lot of um, people talk about you know the creativity and the, and the creative ways that the Oval has been used over the years, and it's been fascinating over the last you know ten episodes going through some of this stuff with you, Tom. Obviously, particularly looking back, I think it was episode five where we talked about yeah. the history of the, the history of the Oval and, and everything. But pedestrianism pretty, to uh, rock concerts, pedestrianism to rock concerts, and and Tom Cruise's helicopter, and all the way through. But yeah, I, I think a lot of the, a lot of that creativity has been born out of necessity and or, or born out of potential disaster. Um, you know, the, the the ground we're facing some 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 pretty. Um, pretty deadly threats over the years and, and yeah looking look look to so the 70s we, we talked about you know the, the who in 71 and frank zappa and and and, and emerson lake and palmer in their giant fire breathing um fire breathing armadillo, um it? whatever they were at the other at the, it was at, an armadillo. At, at the armadillos that's right armadillos the fire giant fire breathing armadillos at the, at the vox land of the ground and pretty much the only reason that happened was because of the cancellation of the 1970 test match um which was due to be england south africa but was cancelled when the apartheid ban was brought in south africa and it ended up being england against the rest of the world and and and, and threw the ground into a financial crisis and then suddenly people started getting creative and, and and you know here were these here were these gigs you know what's another thing there's a photo on the wall of the, the prince of wales room in the pavilion of um um morris allen and jeffrey howard and stuart surridge the great stuart surridge who was i think a uh, director of cricket around the, the early 70s and uh there with the um a quite young prince charles king charles the third as he is now and um are showing him clearly to, to 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 some level of displeasure from the young prince um some idea about building a huge tower block um <laughs> which well, um yeah would have nearly so, look, look, by the looks of things it would have it would, it would have nearly obliterated the place you know so i, I think so you know we, we got away with that one so that's a reminder of the fact that, uh, again, some, going back even before um, the founding of the Oval, right the way back to the Middle Ages, that um, the Oval stands on the site of the palace where the Black Prince was and all kinds of things like that. So mm -hmm. that royal link is still there. So presumably yeah. Prince yeah. William as Prince of Wales now is is basically the landlord. Is that right? Yes. Yeah, yeah. The Duchy of Cornwall is our landlord and, and the Prince Prince William is, is, is the... Um... I can't. I, I'm sure there's a there's a royal word, Tom, that you may be more familiar with. But yeah, he's the head of the Duchy of Cornwall in 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 my eyes. I don't know if there's a, a more. A but more he's sort of more he's not really a cricket term. man, is he? He's much more football. He's. I've seen pictures of him playing cricket. Um. Uh. But yeah, he's he's obviously a football guy. Um. And a, a rugby guy as well. You know, he's obviously got a long history with Welsh rugby. Um. As well as his history with the with the with the English FA. And um, Aston Villa. And indeed, Aston Villa. Yeah, absolutely. Um. So so yeah, he. But 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 as yeah, as, as the Duchy. They're a kind of an amazing landlord to have, really, because our our rent here is is turnover based. So ultimately, the more successful the oval becomes, the more successful our 
our landlord becomes. It seemed, you know, given given the sort of cost <laughs> yeah, of living right. crisis well, that, that we've talked nice, about but... over the years, yeah, that it does seem nice like quite a sensible. Prince. Yeah, well, it also seems like quite a sensible way to do it. You know, I don't know if um, people were saying, "Oh my," you know, you you hear these stories of of young young people in London being sort of thrown out of house flats they're quite happily renting because their landlord suddenly decided to put the rent up by sixty percent. You know, it does seem it certainly seems like it would be fair as if they if they get a new job where they get paid twenty five percent more money that the landlord can stick the stick the rent up yeah, by, by, by by twelve okay, percent. Listen, or but, you know. I, I blew you off course because you were talking <laughs> sure. about Prince Charles as he was then looking askance at a, a tower block development. So that didn't yeah, happen. That didn't happen um, thank But there thank were goodness. all kinds of kind of shenanigans with new stands and Yeah. Well, the, the, uh, the kind the, of the crisis, the, fire, health and safety requirements, and all kinds of yeah. things. And the thing that people will remember is that the Oval basically changed its name to uh, that of a, a, a fizzy Australian beer. Yes, yes. So, it so, so the, thing the Foster's that, Oval. The so thing how did that the happen? Foster's Oval. So, so, so the thing that the the, the, the crisis that, that that led to that particular piece of commercial creativity. Um, was was caused by the really the tragic fire at Valley Parade in in Bradford in 1985, where um, um, there was obviously the um, the wooden the wooden stand that that um, had a lot of rubbish underneath it, and there was a tragic fire, went, yeah, and, and lo- a lot of people died, and it went up. And, and, and the same thing was was present at the Oval. That yeah, so that led to government policy and wooden stands and things. Yeah, that that led to a, a, a fundamental change in government policy, and, and wooden stands needed to go. And and yeah, the um, it was called the, the West Wing of the Pavilion stood where the um, the Badger Stand is now. That and the uh, and the Nets, what's called what was called the Nets Stand. So you know, you talk to someone like John Major. That's where John Major started watching cricket in the nineteen fifties. You know, we talked about you know, with his brown bag of sandwiches and a bottle of Tizer watching Lock and Laker and, and, and sort of, you know, trying not to get splinters um, and that, that sort of thing. And, and yeah, that, that, that had to go, but, you know, by, by all accounts, there were, you know, probably far too many buckets of sand located near stewards for when people discarded old cigarette ends <laughs> yeah, and that sort just, of thing, you know, it, it's just, yeah. it seems like a different, I mean, it was a different age, but it, it seems yeah. like further, further ago than it, than it was. Um, and, and yeah, so, so in the mid eight, once when, when the Valley, parade tragedy happened the oval had been fundraising for quite a long time already to build a new indoor school to commemorate ken barrington who who died uh sadly again tragically early on on an england tour in barbados in the early 80s um and and i think that had got to about five million quid but it was that that was still at least a million quid short of where they where they needed to be and is this when len hutton came in because you talked about yeah Before. Yeah, so the 1988, the 1988 test, um, if you go back and look at photos, the 1988, 1988 test, it was played in the shadow of a huge banner that was hung from the gas holder that said, save the oval. Because, um, yeah, if, if, they, if the bed stand by that stage hadn't been built, if the, the old West Wing and the net stand hadn't been replaced, then the oval would have lost its safety certificate. And, and, and that would have been that. There would have been no more test cricket. And that, that would have been an extremely hard thing to, to, to come back from. So, so I think... It, it may have been a slightly dramatic thing called Save the Oval, but that's what it was called. And yeah, Len Hutton was was recruited as the um, as the patron of the campaign, and so who who by that stage had had retired to to Surrey. And there's a a fellow called um, Sir Michael Sandberg who was brought in by the then Surrey chair, um, who was the recently retired a uh, recently retired chair of HSBC. And um, Pat Pocock, the, the Surrey Surrey spinner, was invited to um, Sandberg's box at a, a, a race meeting. I don't know where. And Pat Pocock came away from the racing day saying that Michael Sandberg was so well connected that I was the only person in there that I'd never heard of. So, <laughs> yeah, that's a great. So, um, that's a great uh, story. Yeah. And, and so the effect um, of all those contacts was that the money was raised. Yeah. Well, the feeling apparently at the time was that, that, that you know, it was like, well, you know, you used to be chair of HSBC, but, you know, you'll do well to raise a quarter of a million quid in a year. And then, you know, we, we, we were in real trouble. He raised a million quid in six months. And and do you think that's, um, I mean, obviously partly down to his his contacts and his campaigning skill and all that, but also to the fact that the Oval is the Oval, that it's yeah. so much a part of, of sport, of London, of of everything. Yeah, I, I mean, think it's more than probably, just a ground, isn't it? It's certainly, it's so much, it's, it's so much more than just a ground. And I think look, what we've demonstrated a lot over the last 10 episodes is, is that it's, I don't hopefully think it's that difficult to tell a story about this place that gets people quite passionate and gets people if if, if you were to if you were to present as a part of that story that there was a threat to the continuation of this place, then I think people would would, would, people would quite would quickly would, would quite quickly get quite angry and rally round. And I think that's what and, that's and, what and they so did. how so how was it that the Oval has gone from being, you know, in danger of being essentially being mothballed to 
being the kind of powerhouse that it is now? Well, look, the key thing I think to that in in terms of the modern era is is the stand in which I'm which I'm now sat, which is now known as the JM Finn stand, and for a long time was the was the OCS stand. It was one of those stands. I, I speak on the day after that Twickenham has announced it's going to be renamed as the Alliant Stadium, and it's one of those stands that never actually had an original name, so therefore people can only but refer it to you to it by the name of the sponsor. Um, and yeah, so so. so Again, if people remember, people of a certain age listen to this podcast, the old Vauxhall end was, was, I think, characterful, it's fair to say, but it was, do you, do you remember this, Tom? It was, you know, higgly, <laughs> higgly piggledy. Yes. You yes, know, there was yeah. three or four stands there, sort of vaguely, you know, most of them, I don't think they were temporary, but they certainly had the feeling that they might have been. Yeah, I it was a kind of, you know, sorry winning the championship in the 50s kind of vibe about it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah Stuart's <laughs> historic, just ends. but perhaps a little bit too historic. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You might have been able to pick up Stuart Sarge's cigarette and still in the in the mid nineties exactly. as a, you yeah. know, some sort of personal memorabilia. Um, so, so yeah, it was it was it was clear that that was what what needed to happen. And obviously, I think yeah, you know, the, the priority in the late eighties and nineties was was to was to get rid of the part of the ground that would have seen it shut down. And then you know, attention then turned to the uh, to the to the Vauxhall end. And and yeah, so so what happened is that that the Surrey leadership then are chair uh, at the time David Stewart who died a couple of years ago and and, and Paul Sheldon the chief exec who's, who's still with us um uh they negotiated a staging agreement with the UCB um so so this is a, a, a new thing hadn't happened in English cricket before and ultimately it was an agreement that guaranteed the overall test match every year from 2002 to 2022 and as such they were then able to borrow money from the banks to knock down yeah what existed at the Voxland and, and, and build this new stand because previously they tried to borrow money off the banks and the banks looked at the books and just said, well, the vast majority of your money comes from a test match every year. And, and what happens if you, you know, show us a piece of paper to guarantee that match is going to be held at the Oval every year. And they couldn't. And the bank said, well, we're not going to lend you the money then because we, we there's no guarantee that you're, there's no guarantee that you're good for it. So, so yeah, that, that stage agreement was amazing. I, I think also extraordinarily it's, it's been, you know, viewed by a lot of other grounds as, as this amazing, um, thing that the Oval had that no one else, no one else had. But but my understanding is that is that Lords were offered a similar one at the time and um, decided to turn it down because um, there were some rights within the staging agreement that the ECB demanded that the um, that the ground give up and Lords decided that they wouldn't give those rights up and, and and they'd exploit them themselves. And yeah, it's been estimated that Lords lost around about twenty million quid by not signing that because then for the next twenty years they had to go through the process of applying to host test matches and and, and whatever. So it, it really that that I then. Mean- has, has it, allowed it, the, the the ground to have some security and some solidity to to build from, because that again has been a theme running throughout this series is the contrast between the two great London grounds, so Lords mm. and the Oval, and it's the Finchley Cricket that, Ground. That that Lords, um, I mean Lords is the cathedral of cricket. Uh, it's it's the headquarters. It's the home of cricket. It's. So they say. It's the stately home <laughs> of cricket. Um, yeah. It's it's very posh. I mean, that's it's vibe. Yeah, and I'm not drawing the parallels Oval's between vibe, the MCC and the National Trust. Well, it, the Oval's vibe, as again as we've talked, we, you know, it's owned by uh, the Prince of Wales, or at least it stands on, you know, it's leased from the Prince of Wales. So it's ha- always had that royal connection, but it has also always been the people's ground. You know, it was built uh, on Kennington Common. Um, mm. to, to to try and provide access for people in in South London, and I guess that that the willingness to it's a slight kind of Del Boy quality, a bit you know, a bit of wheeling and dealing, taking a punt, you know, always having to live slightly more hand to mouth than Lords has done, and yeah. maybe maybe that kind of reflects what what you were saying on that the 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 readiness of of Surrey to take a punt on something like that. Over and against the MCC, who clearly weren't. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. There, there is, as, as, as you say, it's that the, the the people's ground and a, and, a, and a royal ground. And and look, I think one of the things as an organisation, as a ground, as a club, that you always want to be sure of is that you're being defined positively. You're being defined how you want to be. You're defined <laughs> by what by by what you want to be. Um, you don't want to be defined by what you're not. You don't want to be defined. In a, in, a, in, a, in a negative context to say, well, okay, this is what this people stand for and you're not that, therefore you're this. And that, I think, is something that the Oval has has never had to do because the Oval and Lords are these beautifully complementary of each other. Yeah, they I are don't beautifully think... complementary. 
and really and, and there's a rivalry here, as as we've referenced throughout the throughout the podcast. But it's 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 a very friendly rivalry, and everyone at the Oval is hugely respectful of what has come before at Lords. And I and, and I know everyone at the Oval is at Lords is hugely respectful of, of what has come at the Oval. But but ultimately, what Lords has always stood to stand for, and what Lords has always stood to represent, I think, is very very different to what the Oval has always stood yeah. to stand for, and what yeah. the Oval has always stood to represent. And and therefore, neither ground has felt undue pressure to try and move in a direction it wouldn't necessarily be comfortable with because if you wanted something slightly different, you know if you, if you if you if you weren't into bacon and egg ties and straw boaters and 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 that sort of thing fine come watch your cricket at the oval you know if if you felt the oval was you know not quite your a little bit too as you say del boyish for you or or, or or you know you you wanted something that that felt you know a little bit a little a little bit more establishment and a little bit more you know, sort of brass. You, <laughs> you know, are killing brass necks or whatever. You, and then pop, you are killing with soft phrase here, John. You really no, are. But well, I, 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 th- I think I you think... can tell on this podcast which one my vibe is. <laughs> but, but I, I, but certainly other people feel very differently, and that's cool. I think. I mean, I think there can be no doubt, having done this series, um, and having read up much more about the history of the Oval than than I had done before, that it really is the most extraordinary fascinating complex and influential sports ground in britain maybe in the world because britain is the home of sport uh it's it's emblematic as a cricket ground it's it's roots in the victorian period the process of by which sport became professionalized and codified uh the parabola over the 20th century and into the 21st century but also the readiness of the Oval basically to try anything. So whether it's people walking a thousand miles <laughs> in a thousand hours or whether it's rock concerts or whatever it is, um, the Oval is always willing to have a go. Um, and John, I would like to thank you for giving me, having given me the chance to do the series because uh, you, you approached me and uh, basically I leapt at the chance. But it, it's been even more fascinating than I thought it would be when we began it. So thank you very much for, for that. But above all, thank you to the listeners, um, those who followed us through this innings. Um, and I think the time has come to take the bales of the stumps and to retire to the pavilion. So thank you very much for listening. Bye bye. Thank you. Goodbye.